Still, welcome to an actor despairs. How you doing, brother? I'm I'm all right. I'm uh, I'm not despairing too much today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to here in Brooklyn, man. It's dark days, man. It's yeah. weird times. I, hey, man. I know yeah. it's uh it's interesting, man, because like I think our experience as New Yorkers, we're experiencing this in a different way than everyone else in the United States. You know yeah, I mean? man. I just can't. I came out from my living room and like CNN people are chilling in Clearwater, like nothing's happening in Florida. Right. So. Right. Just, bizarre to me while I'm watching like corpses in my neighborhood you know it's, it's so strange you know what I mean it's so strange but at, at the same time like it's um you know like I'm uh I was born in New York man and like this is my home and and uh I'm actually really proud of the way the city's handling this and yeah you know, like uh I find it interesting that that uh you know a lot of people are being told and forced to stay home and, and then here in New York because it's very real to us we're just like, no, dude, I don't want to go in the restaurant. I yeah. don't want to go inside and totally. in space and breathe this stuff, man. We have a completely different relationship with this because it's, it's here. It's real, man. It's, it's, yeah. it's tangible. Yeah, totally, man. Well, to, to keep it up, uh, I'm sorry, I kind of buoyed it to a negative thing right away. Oh, but Death. You know what I mean? No. Like, you know, everyone's out of work. <laughs> oh, dude. Well, I just hit up my agent manager. I'm fucked. It's all good though. I got this podcast, baby. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta adapt. You gotta yeah. But yeah. dude, I, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, man, you, uh, you're one of my all time, if not my favorite actor. Like I've looked up to you since I was a kid, man. I, oh, wow. Thank you're, you. you're not going to believe the thing I discovered you in because it's probably the least thing you would ever su suspect. But the first thing I ever saw you in was the black Donnelly's. And, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. And I like, I told Morgan Spector this. I told Shay Wiggum this when they were on the show, man. And yeah. there's something about your energy. And I was like, and it's the difference between good acting and great acting. And I talk about this a lot on this podcast, but like, you're one of the greatest actors in the world. There's an energy, like Rubicon is one of my all time favorite shows. Oh man. Thanks. I got to, I got to do a movie with Roger Robertson and all we did was geek yeah. out about you. Oh, okay, that is. <laughs> um, but, but uh, man, I, I need to hear that, man, because, you know, it's like the actor's brain tells us something else. Dude, you, when I started this podcast, they were like, who's your dream guest? I said, James Batchdale. So today is a dream come true, man. I, I mean that with every word of sincerity. I, uh, um, wow, that's a lot of pressure. And, and we got a lot of mutual friends, you know, like yeah. Shay, Bernthal. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I mean, yeah. talk about, I mean, those guys, Shay Wiggum one of my favorite actors of all time. I've been watching him for, you know, 15, 20 years. John Bernthal, good friend of mine, like he knocks me out every time. Yeah. Uh, you know, John, John Polono, who we both know as yeah. a genius playwright and writer. Totally. I acted with him on stage and we did his play Small Engine Repair in New York, man. Like one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life acting with that dude, man. I did it. I played Swino. That's why oh, I was on. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> so, yeah. but. Yeah, man. So let's let's start at the beginning. You grew up in New York, right? Your mom was a dancer. My my mother was a, a dancer and an actress, and my father was an actor and a dancer. Oh wow! Also, um, like Broadway or classical? Broadway. No, man. My, my dad was in the original West Side Story. No way. Uh, yeah. OG oh, man. He moved to New York when he was seventeen years old. Uh, he came from a pretty violent alcoholic uh, household outside of Pittsburgh and he came here with $200 and he never went back home. He never asked for money. And he, he um, you know, he, 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 he was good, man. My father was a powerful dancer. And by the time he was 21, he was on his third Broadway show. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, he, he did it the hard way. And he was in the original West side story and uh, Jerome Robbins became a good uh, 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 influence on him. Yeah, he didn't have a father figure. You know, totally. let's get deep, man. We're gonna get deep into acting. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, totally. Uh, my father didn't have a father figure. My his father disappeared, so my grandfather uh, and his, my father's stepfather, um, you know, was doing the best he can, but he had a, a really bad drinking problem, and so my father kind of looked up to Jerome Robbins and my father didn't think he was a good actor. My father didn't, he, he was a talented dancer, but he never trusted 
as we all do, he had that voice that says, yeah. no, nah, man, you suck, man. You can't do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't look good. You don't sound good. I don't believe a word you're saying. It's all bullshit. So my father quit acting when he was in his late 20s. No way. And he started directing and being a choreographer. And he trained under Jerome Robbins. So my father went off and had this amazing kind of career yeah. as a director and a choreographer. Uh, and... He never really went back to acting, but I, I, I was watching a movie with him. He did a movie called Young Girls of Rochefort yeah. uh, with the Deneuve uh, sisters. And uh, it was all in French. And we were watching the movie and he was about 75 years old at the time. And he turns to me halfway through the movie and he goes, I was wrong. I was a good actor. I should have kept going. Oh and my God. I, I just. Uh, he must have been speechless. Yeah, that was a big moment. That was a moment for me as an actor to hear someone else say that. Yeah. I, I can relate to that, but also to hear your father say that to you. Yeah. To hear your father say to his son that he listened to these voices and uh, that told him, no, you can't. You know, all those negative voices. Wow. And um, yeah, I'll never forget that. I, I, he gave me a big gift. What moment. a beautiful... Thank you for sharing that, man. I think every actor listening need to hear that. I needed to hear that, you know? I mean, yeah. I think we all have those people, let alone our head, telling us, you don't fucking have it. It's not going to happen for you. Give up. Right. You're a, fuck, you're a fucking loser. You right. know what I mean? Go, go work at Bowery Hotel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the crazy thing is, like, not only are we telling ourselves that, you're surrounded by people in an industry that it's constant rejection. Yeah, I mean, we just our job is getting punched in the face and knocked down every day. And dude, the amount of times I went up for High Town, I was like, "Ah, oh, fuck oh, no, did you? <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, I'm sorry, man. It's all right, man. It's all good. I gotta call somebody, man. <laughs> I wish I had some actual power in this industry, man. Oh, dude, you have it, man. You're you're one of the best in the world, man. Truly. But uh, so then talk to me as as a child. I feel like when you have your parents in the business, it goes one of two ways. You're like. I'm into this. You're like, fuck this. This is taking my mom and dad away from me all the time. Right. What, where, where, where did it lie for you? Um, you know, the interesting thing, I, I was an only child. Uh, and both my parents, so my father was a director and a choreographer. My mother, uh, you know, was an actor. And uh, they were both gone all the time. Yeah. You know, separately. My father would go do a play in New York. My, my mother would go do a film over here. We, you know, it, it's... I, I kind of had a very solitary, independent childhood. Interesting. And that worked for me. Same. You Would you? I, mean? I I interjected into skateboarding. What was yours? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got I got big into skateboarding. Oh no way! <laughs> I fell in love with playing hockey when I was ten years old. Wow. And and I, I played hockey for a long time, and then uh, uh, I got huge. I got big into skateboarding because I was by this point I was in Los Angeles in the early nineties. So oh, like wow. the skate punk scene was just exploding and we were just a bunch of, oh man, we were just a bunch of hoodlums, man. We, we had a lot of fun, probably too much fun. And, um, you know, truth be told, I got in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Same. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I was, uh, uh, I, uh, I'll say I got arrested. I ended up doing, uh, uh eight months in a group home as a, as a young man, as an 18 year old, 19 year old. And uh, I got an opportunity to go play hockey in Utah. Wow. For so, college? For, uh, for a junior hockey team in the Western States Hockey League. Wow. And I played there for two years, and only two schools recruited me. It was one other team in Utah, and then it was a, a, a small Division III uh, college in New York called Manhattanville. And I was like, let's go. Let's go back to New York. And, yeah. and uh, I fell in love with theater back in, uh, in New York, man. That's so beautiful, man. Was there, was there a piece? Was there a moment? Like, was there, where did the, the switch happen? You know, um, two things happened. Because uh, to go back to your question, when you have parents who are actors, you yeah. either go one way or the other way. The truth is, the, the lifestyle made a lot of sense to me, yeah. but I wanted to do something else. I didn't want to be an actor. I always found it as selfish. It's, yeah. Or for me, it felt selfish. I would get up on stage and I'd be like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it was about getting off my fix. Yeah. And um, I wanted to go do something else. And uh, uh, I got hurt 
it was that first I was a goaltender. So I got oh, hip thing for a shit. little bit. And and my hip went and uh I uh I had been in the theater program because I figured like that's the easiest thing to study that I could just get by and I'll keep playing hockey. And then I, you know, maybe I'll do two years of NCAA D3 and then I'll go play minor pro somewhere and kind of yeah. work my way up the hard way and be like, you know, and, uh, uh, yeah, hockey just wasn't working for me. And all my energy went into the theater program. It was like this transference of this, this thing that I needed that was so alive. Yeah. And, um, and I've said this before, so I saw Judith Light do the play Wit in 1999 at the Union Square Theater. Wow. Right there uh, uh, where NIFA used to be or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I went to Strasburg, so I know it well. Oh, Yo, you're yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. On 16th or 15th in Strasburg. Yeah, Lee Strasburg yeah. Way or whatever they renamed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's funny. I went, to, I went to Stella Adler. Oh, no back, way. Back when they were on Lafayette. That's why you're so much better oh, than me. Here, I went to NYU, so I did that whole. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, we were running in the same circles, man. That's hilarious, man. So then, when you come back to New York, you know, and given the the fact that your parents were, let alone icons, or worked so much in Broadway, was it theater or film, or was it just acting? You know, it was. I, I just really wanted to do theater. Yeah. When, when I came back to New York, and I had that experience of Judith Light doing the play Wit. And my mother had died of cancer six years before that. Yeah. And I saw Judith Light do this play, and I grieved my mother's death for the first time properly in that theater. Like something just came out of me, man. I couldn't leave the theater. I was sitting there. I mean, it was dead empty. And Judith was a friend of my mother's. Yeah. And, and uh, I just couldn't stop crying. And it yeah. was like six years of, of pent up despair, yeah. sadness anger, guilt, all this stuff just came out. And I went backstage and I hugged Judith. And that was the moment I wanted to be an actor. That was the moment where I was like, there's honor to this. It's not about me. Yeah. It's about affecting an audience member. Yeah. If I could do for one person what Judith did for me, yeah. then my job as an actor is complete. I've told the story properly. I've helped someone else out. And, and it kind of like, it switched. And all I wanted to do was theater. And then I realized I'm really not very good on stage. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> yeah, a little bit on camera, you know? Yeah. Do some actor tricks. So then when, when in the early 2000s, I know we live in a fucking weird time now where like Facebook and Yahoo are doing content. Right. Were you doing play circuit, like theater circuits, or were you doing co-star, guest star? Man, I did. I was doing, I dropped out of college. Same. <laughs> I was just like, I can't do it. Uh, can't play hockey. It just doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So I, I, I and, and I, the theater department at Manhattanville was very good to me. Yeah. They, um, they gave me a, a good base and I launched back into the world and I came to the city and I worked construction all day and I did every play I could at night. I mean, I was literally doing plays for no money in the middle of no, I mean, the smallest black box theaters, yeah. non-equity, just, Five people in the audience didn't matter. Yeah, and it was it was a different time I think for New York too because yeah. it was this. New York still had a little bit of grit and roughness. It was before capitalism destroyed it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <It's before> Disney. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have said that. No, it's all good. It's all, we can edit it out. So here we, we'll pick it back up. Yeah. It's right when capitalism destroyed it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so New York City used to be really good. <laughs> But it was also that time when, like, you could be a young, broke, starving artist. Yeah. You know, it was a glory side for nothing. Oh, man, dude, we yeah. were on Avenue B, and we were just running. There was, we were, I was packed in an apartment with a bunch of other actors, and you're literally just subletting place to place to place. You, you know, yeah. come in with, like, a, 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 a trash bag full of clothes. Yeah. And crash in some mattress in a corner for two months, and run and, like, maybe do a play or two, and then be, like, another actor friend and be like, hey, I got a bedroom that opened up in Queens, and we'd run over there, and you run over back over to here to the Lower East Side, and, and it was fun. And people were hustling, you know yeah. what I mean? It was, uh, and the theater scene was weird and experimental and people would come see the, the plays. Agents yeah. and managers would come see them. People were hunting for, for young, unknown actors. Yeah, you're um, doing the downtown theater scene? Man, yeah, dude, my first, 
Equity Play was at the Flea Theater. Uh, no down way. Tribeca. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, did a play called Getting Into Heaven. I just had Jane Rosenthal in. We talked to him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, man. And then, and then talk to me, because like at that time, I know, obviously I mentioned I discovered you on Black Donnelly's. Like NBC, ABC, Fox, CBS, that was where you went to. Were you doing those like networks for co-star, guest star, reoccurring stuff? Um, yeah, man. I'm, I mean, yeah, my first TV show was uh, Law & Order, Special Victims Unit. Oh, <laughs> nice. New York Rite of Passage. Fuck yeah, dude. Yet to have it. Peter yeah. Scanavino's my boy, though. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Peter Scanavino. Do you know him? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. my homie. Yeah. <laughs> right Good dude. Yeah. yeah. I, I had fun in that. Uh, man, I went way too far on that. I was, uh, how do I say this, man? I was like 22, 23 years old. Yeah. And I'm doing Special Victims Unit. And um, I was, um, I was unfortunately way too method. Way, 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 way too method that you ever want to be. Way too method than you ever should be on a guest star on a, on a <laughs> Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Yeah. And um, my character had some problems with speech. So I never was, I would just stay in character the whole time. Yeah. And I was a huge fan of Chris Maloney. <laughs> no, Oz, man. <laughs> yeah, Oz. yeah. Oz. Talk to Montana, no, another great dude. dude. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, yeah. that. You know, and that Oz was a huge show for New York, also. For New York, Dean Winters, one of my homies, man, one of my closest. Oh, friends. he's un yeah. I, he he on, got man. my podcast started, man. If it weren't for Dean Winters, I wouldn't be doing this right now. Yeah, or Tom I've Fontana. Never, I've never met him in person, but we're like, hey. common friends. Oh, we're gonna go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, weird thing is we played brothers on Rescue Me, way back season one. Oh yeah, Dennis Leary's thing. Yeah. FX, yeah. man. Yeah, but we never crossed paths because I think he, uh, it was, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what happened. It was like the last two episodes and they're like, guess what? You have a younger brother too. And then we had like this separate storyline. It never worked. <laughs> like, why am I doing I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm sucking, man. I, I'm not funny, you know? Yeah. Fuck, man. He's a good dude. I heard he's a really good dude. Oh, uh, dude, we'll go out, man, for sure. He's the best. But, uh, dude, that's amazing. So then when you kind of get, uh, endowed or knighted so to speak and you're getting these credits do you flex up agent manager wise and start going for bigger things because like your career and i mean this man is like it's it's better than brad pitt's it's better than leo's you do better work you work more you work with cooler actors like i i mean dude like you're the best man like write that down so. <laughs> i mean every word of it like you shea wiggum and chris bauer you know, like you and I are, are just becoming buddies, but like I'm homies with them. And like the work you guys do is like, I don't believe in God, but if I did, I would say it's God's work. Oh, uh, that's, that's, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if Brad and Leo feel that way. But... <laughs> I'll tell them when they come on the show. <laughs> no, I mean, guys, you know, and here's the wild thing, man. Like I, I've, I have to go off topic, man, but I've been doing this for a long time. I've, I've, I've been doing it for almost 20 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I've done the small plays in the small places. I've done movies with Leo and Brad. Yeah. They're some of the coolest, nicest guys. And, like, and this is what I want to say to, like, what I think people don't understand is, man, they earned it. Yeah. When you work with Denzel, like, that dude is no joke. Yeah. That dude's work ethic is 10 times greater than every other dude I ever worked with. You know yeah. what I mean? These guys show up to work prepared. They can sling, they can throw, there's no mistake. And they also treat it with that special thing. They know that this can go away at any moment. Yeah. They don't take anything for granted. It means a lot. And that's, I like that, man. I, and that's what I, did, what yeah. I love about like the immediacy of theater. Yeah. Every moment on stage, it fucking means something, you know? Yeah. And film is the same way, man. It's a, uh, and I think for every department, you know what I mean? Like you yeah. want it to be special. You want it to mean something, you know? I've spoken to Shay off the record about this, but like, was it your goal to work with these types? Like you did The Departed, you worked, you did Shame with Fassbender. Like obviously everyone's goal is to work with great artists, but I'm, I'm curious like how it manifested for you. Where did that, where did, was it Rubicon? Was that like coming after Breaking Bad? Did that really open a lot of doors for you? I don't know. I, you know, it kind of goes back to your question. Like where, where was the, the, the business yeah. level of this and the agents and the managers and the opportunities that you're getting. Yeah. Um, someone a long time ago told me that like work, work creates work. Yeah. And 
and I'm just, I'm not good at planning things. Uh, all my ex-girlfriends will attest to that. <laughs> I've never planned a career. Yeah. I'm not plotted. It's never made sense to me that if an actor does this, it'll get you this. It's not and, Game of Thrones or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, this thing is weird. It's its yeah. own organism. And the one thing I have control over is my own work, my own work ethic. Yeah. And and saying no in some weird way. Yeah. You know, th there's a weird balance that you have to have of, am I excited by this? You have to ask yourself, am I the right person for this also? Every actor wasn't meant for every role. No. And it's easy to think that because you want to work so bad. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm auditioning for things and it's like a <laughs> hard and a round hole. And I'm like, why do I suck so bad? <laughs> oh, no. God, God dude. God, it's just like kicking me out of the rooms. Yeah. You know? I mean, and that was, that was back in the day, man. Like we were just hustling from audition to audition in person in New York. Like I would live and my bosses were great. Yeah. I mean, I'd be covered in sheetrock dust and I'd be like, Hey, I got that audition. Can I get off for 45 minutes and run up to Midtown? And they'd be like, yo, get out of here. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'd be running in, dude. My hair would be all messed up like that. <laughs> Covered in dirt. Probably know? only made you get the role, man. Fuck, I need to get a construction job. You gotta help me out. <laughs> I was like, gee, man. Um, I also had no social abilities and I couldn't work in a restaurant. So uh, I mean, dude. it fucking worked for me. Yeah. Um, I've been fired from everyone. I was an alcoholic and drug addict. Four years sober, so hey, I man, get it. So yeah. Good. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. That's why I'm crushing Red Bull right now. Talk <laughs> to you, Brian Red Bull. <laughs> but uh Dude, so yeah, sorry for geeking out on you, bro. Um, but I'm curious, man. So then I'm curious, like, you know, the departed happened, and that was such a smash hit. Not that Scorsese's never delivered anything short, but you're in there with Leo, and you're such a titanic part of the of the narrative, you know, let alone the end. Did that open a lot? I mean, I imagine so. It opened a lot of doors for you. You know, um, yeah, I did. L listen, let me, let me, I, I, I'm eternally grateful for that experience. Yeah. That life experience to be a part of that movie, uh, to get to work with Marty, Leo, Matt, uh, I mean, all those guys, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. Who, by the way, Mark Wahlberg crushes every scene in that movie. Dude, I heard he denied the role for so many times. And then, oh. He, yeah. Oh, it's like, <laughs> it's like, this dialogue is so good. And yeah. Kind of, I mean, um, I, I had a great time on that film. I was scared shitless. I, uh, I had almost quit acting before that movie. Wow. There was, a weird, there was a weird switch. There was right before that. And this was before the Black Donnellys. Yeah. I, I'd done a, a, a TV show, 24. I got fired. I remember that. 24. What happened? I mean, I, you don't have to go into it if you don't want to. Oh, no. I, oh. I will do that. All right, let's before. fucking go, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love actors. Because you were, I forgot you were on that. Because, like, I, I remember that show when it aired. I watched it, but it's been, I don't know, what is that, 15 years? <laughs> yeah, man. That was 03. You know, I got, um, uh, uh, I was doing that play at the Flea Theater. Just got yeah. my equity card. And I'm doing that play, and it was 03. And the audition came in for 24. Yeah. And I read it, and I was like, nah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going in for it. It was one of those things where I was like, I'm not the right guy. Yeah. I'm not the right guy for this. There's a certain type of acting on these shows and I, I uh, on, on network. And I was like, I, I feel uncomfortable. I'm too weird to be on. And that was like, people don't understand. That was like the breaking bad of its time. You was, know? Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it was, uh, it was a really good show. And, um, uh, I come into the theater another night and the same audition is on, is in my dressing room. And they say it's like a 10 AM audition. And I was like, fuck man, I don't have time to say no. It's seven 30. Yeah. I'm locked in now. And, and uh, so I go to the show, I go home, I work on it. It's just a couple of pages. You know what I mean? Very, you know, hard line, secret. Agent. Procedural shit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, it, 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 I, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to tell you why, why Kiefer is so genius. Um, Anyway, point is, it was one of those things I auditioned and they just fucking hired me. Yeah. They, did, they flew me out to Los Angeles. They go, you screen test and this is your job. And so I, I, I was working construction. Yeah. I was doing off, 
off Broadway theater yeah. for like what 300 bucks a week yeah you know what I mean like like I don't have a choice in this matter it's a great opportunity I'm 25 years old you yeah. know and uh, uh I show up to work and I started learning I started learning from Kiefer I started learning why he was so good on that show yeah. because he's coming in with a lifetime worth of experience yeah played so many different characters his understanding of material and story structure is 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 it's it's special it's unique and that comes with time spent you yeah. got to put in the hours to understand it like that yeah so he would rewrite everything so we'd show up to set and he'd be like we would rehearse and we'd be like wait a minute this works this doesn't work this works. and he'd be like this is bullshit 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 and he turns to me on day three and he turns to John Cassar, the director, and the rest of the crew, and he goes, this kid gets to say whatever he wants. Whatever you want to do, do it. We want, wow. you know? And it was that thing of like, he was like, I trust you. Yeah. But here's the thing. Don't ever mistake that for like being self-indulgent. You know yeah. what I mean? He trusted me because he was like, wait a minute, I think you'll do the right thing for the story. Yeah. That's what we're all trying to do, make the overall work. Yeah. And so I worked with him for a year. I had a great time. Uh, I, I made lifetime friends on that show and then they fired there were seven series regulars including Kiefer they fired all six of us at the upfronts in New York City literally at the literally at the front door man as you're like walking the red carpet doing the I thing walked, <laughs> oh, dude, dude I walked up and I hate doing publicity I'm not yeah. good at it you know what I mean and 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 I went up I got my suit they were gonna send a car and I was like no dude it's a beautiful day in New York I'm gonna take the subway I put on a suit. I take the subway to Central Park. I've been staying down on a, 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 a bleaker in Bowery. Yeah. yeah. And um, I show up, and there's the press line. And I'm like, fuck. Uh, I don't want to do this, man. And the publicist, the Fox publicist, sees me. And he's like, hey, Badge, how you doing? I'm like, hey, what's up? And he goes, you know what? You don't have to do it today. Don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, man, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> and... Um, uh, I got a phone call from Rayco Aylesworth, right? I walked away and I was like, that's weird. Rayco Aylesworth calls me and she goes, we all just got fired. And I was like, what? and sure enough, they call me next. And, um, you know, listen, uh, I, I have no ill will. Uh, I have no regrets. I think that people who create TV shows, who yeah. write films, direct, you have the right to decide what story you want to tell. Yeah. And if, if you want to go in a different direction, yeah. man, go for it. And I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I woke up the next morning and I was in New York City and it was spring. It's May. You know, the sun is shining and the trees are <laughs> yeah. and I was like, yeah, dude. And I was like, you know what? This is, I got my freedom back. I could move back to New York and I could do any play I want. Yeah. And I didn't work for nine months after that, man. I mean, I was like unhirable. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm used to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and uh, uh, The Departed was my first job back, really. Wow. What a and job it, to come into. It, it, it was, but I had to go through some darkness and some despair to get there. I realized that if I'm putting, if I'm basing my self worth on other people hiring me to be an actor, yeah. I'm going to lose, man. Yeah. It, it's a, it, you don't want to live that way. Yeah. I don't like myself that way. And I don't think good work as an actor comes from that place. Totally. And you kind of had to get to a place in your life where you just go, fuck it, fuck you, man. I don't care. Yeah. This is what I do. This is what I offer. This is my instinct. Yeah. And if I'm not the right guy, the next actor, I really hope will be the right person. Because yeah. as a filmmaker, you deserve to have what you need to fulfill your vision. And so I just stopped caring. And then I went in for Scorsese and I was like, I just don't care. Yeah. This is what I do. This is what I bring. Yeah. And then Scorsese was like, you want to be in my movie? And I was like, oh, no, I'm in so much trouble now, man. Now I got to like. <laughs> <laughs> and you're fucking amazing in that thing. And, and it started oh, the trend of, of many great Boston accents of yours. <laughs> Yeah, that thing <laughs> comes and goes sometimes, man. Goes. I know it well, man. That's amazing, man. And I'm curious because Scorsese and Spielberg are so tight. Did that lead to the Pacific for you? 
Um, actually, that's uh, uh, it, not that I know of. Okay. I, I don't know. Um, the Pacific, again, I was, I was having a rough one. I was, I was back in New York. I was doing theater. Um, and uh, I was, uh, man, I think I had taken a, a, a brief moment to, to wash dishes at my friend's bar restaurant wow. for the winter. And, um, and this is know, after the departed. Oh, it was after the departed. Wow. A few years later, man, this was uh, a few years later. And, um, you know, having one of those moments of like rethinking, like, what am I doing? Doesn't mean anything, life? you know, like even when you work, you don't work after, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's all our thoughts as actors are the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, 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 it doesn't seem to change. Yeah. Every, we're all in the space of my God, is that the last job I'll ever do? Yeah. When will I work again? You know yeah. what I mean? Everyone is in this fear of like, oh, I'm at the end. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's natural. Um, yeah, but the, the, the Pacific was, man, I auditioned for that and they said no. Wow. You know, like I, I went in for Robert Lecky and in the helmet, York, helmet on my pillow, right? Because that was his book. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. his book. Man. Yeah, he was a really poetic writer and uh, great writer. Yeah, dude, I, I, um, you know, he he passed in '03, I believe. Um, I've become close to his wife wow. and his children, and um, I'm uh, the, the Pacific is a really special job, you know, and, and for all of us who did that. You know? And for the younger audience listening, just to give them context, Band of Brothers was obviously such a smash hit yes. for for Playtone, Tom Hanks, Spielberg, I imagine. Because World War II was, was literally so epic that they decided to focus on the Pacific part of it, literally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it was, you know, it was a different theater of war. I think it yeah. was, it was, it, uh, it, it, it really, it really, we wanted to explore like the, the darkness that a man can go through in, yeah. in, in combat. I think the Pacific theater was especially brutal and visceral and hand to hand. And yeah. um, some of the, the worst of us is, people you know what i mean yeah and, um but uh uh you know i wasn't i don't think i was ever supposed to be there the weird thing was I, i'm doing this play i read for the producers in los angeles for the pacific and they said no man you're, you're not the guy we're looking for you're you know you're too old and, surprise guest yo <laughs> yo <laughs> <Don> Polono. <laughs> what's going on buddy What's up, Polano, my man? Fuck this up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what up, Polono? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there we go. I got up here. Yeah. yeah. What's what going on, man? Doing? How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Good to see you, dude. How you feeling, Ryan? You okay? I'm, I'm hanging in there, man. I'm I'm down at Red Bulls and Seltzer Waters, man. I don't know if that's good. Probably not. Your stomach, is it? No, but I got some fucking pills here to help with the nausea. I was sick yesterday, James. Oh, you sick? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what, what kind of sick, man? I, uh, dude, I, I started taking this thing called like Kratom, and I think I took way too much of it, and I fucking started throwing up like crazy yesterday. Oh, that's okay. And then because of the craziness, I decided to like get a telehealth doctor, and he gave me yeah. a bunch of stuff that's helping me out. I feel much better now. Good, good. It could also be the hey, Red Bull. Hey, Badge, where are you at? Man? Red Bull. Are you in Montauk? Badge, are you in Montauk? Yeah, man, I'm out here, man. You're like, your whole living situation is built for quarantine, pretty much. It kind of is, man. Like, weirdly, we had 10-foot waves in front of my house on Saturday. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Bombing. Your quarantine situation, bro, you got that house with the backyard. Uh, yeah, but, you know. My kids aren't in school. It's kind of hard to do anything. Yeah. How are you as a teacher? <laughs> Dude, I'm not very good. Uh, you know, What's your worst subject? Of, they don't do math the same way. Everything's <laughs> different. Everything you think you remember, you don't. How did they change math? They just do it differently. Like, long division is, like, it's so different. I, I don't even know. It's like, I just pull up my an app. There's actually websites you go to that show you how they do math now and stuff. It's, it's way different. Probably better, but it's way different. Yeah. That's why I never learned it in the first place, because I knew it was going to change. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Should also say for the audience now that's saying, like, what the fuck, John Polono is the magnificent writer behind Small Engine Repair. 
which Badge did, I did, and now he and Shay and Berthal are about to have come out. So yeah. the legend continues. Yeah, man. Keep it in hey, the I didn't know you were actually – this was like the podcast. I thought it was so hello. I'm sorry to interrupt on your shit. Oh, no, no. Badge it's cool, dude. Thing. Thing. No, man. I'm going to tell – one of my favorite actor stories, and it has to do with John Polono. Oh, so wow. We're doing the play in New York. John is the playwright, and he's the actor, and we're on stage every night, and this is his New York theater. I mean, it's really, it's his, it's his premiere, man. This is a big right. moment, and um, the, the, the stress is palpable. <laughs> he's an actor, an artist who has is, is come his entire life up to this moment. And the New York Times releases the review by accident two days early. No, it's, a love letter. it's a love letter to John Polono. They called him the next David Mamet. They were like, whenever he wants to write another play, please bring it to New York. And the look on John Polono's face when he came into the dressing room that evening and he got on stage, man, that, that is one of the greatest moments I've ever had as an actor to watch this man go through that experience. And... Um, I'm uh, I'm 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 all I'm forever grateful to you, brother, for letting me uh, go through that with you, man. Oh, uh, dude, that was awesome. I, it, except it's not true because I don't read reviews. <laughs> <It's totally true. laughs> anyway, I think my my favorite image of that doing that play was was Badge bundled up in winter gear, riding a BMX bike down the middle of Christopher Street in in the in snow, in two feet of snow. Oh so. my God! But in between shows, man, that's how I, I would go home after. <laughs> Badge, also, I went to the screening with Polono, Shea, and Bernthal in L.A., and I, I, my shoulder ended up getting more screen time than, than you did in that, in that scene. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, great. Best no, I, listen, shoulder. I honestly have, I have 10 minutes of footage of, see, those guys just, like, improv for, like. Oh, so fun to watch. I have 10 minutes of B-roll of that, or whatever you call that deleted shit that is hilarious it's so funny it's like an snl sketch i'll have to <laughs> care at some point it's so good yeah. you gotta all put right. that on the bonus we'll that day, man. yeah exactly i don't know if they yeah we'll see all right brother hey love to you guys be safe be uh well. feel good and uh i'll talk to you soon badge keep sending photos of that beach man it's hey brother stuff. All, right. <laughs> all right all right love you Polona. later brother <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So back to the Pacific. So you, you're you're getting that. And... Oh, oh, oh! This is this is what I wanted to say, man. Yeah. Like my audition process was totally different than the other guys because of this weird circumstance where they had said no to me. So they all went through this six months audition process with Spielberg. You know, got, they were he was in the room with them filming and, yeah. and this whole thing. And I, uh, I ended up I was. Uh, uh, going for HBO's Generation Kill. Oh. So, um, totally could see it. My, David Simon? Yeah, yeah, I'm David Simon. I, my boy Mark Menchaca and Tommy Pelfrey did it. Or yeah. Tommy went up for it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. James Ransom. Yeah, PJ, yeah. yeah Fuck. PJ. Fuck. Fuck. Genius in yeah. Generation Kill, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right, I'm just going to tell all the stories, man. Fuck this <laughs> yeah, let's go, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally doing this play. They fly me to London to hang out with David Simon for one day on my one day off of rehearsal. So I'm there, I'm, I'm auditioning and David's giving me direction and I had to stop halfway through and I was like, David, I, and I could see he's getting frustrated. I was like, David, I, I just want you to know, I understand what you're telling me. You're yeah. being very clear. I'm having a real problem doing it. Like I, I understand it. I don't know how to give it to you. Yeah very nice conversation. He was like, work on this. They had me come in again. I'm working. I'm still not giving it to him. Yeah. They say, okay, we're going to do a screen test. It's myself and Alexander Sarsgaard. And, uh, you know, he's like mm, coolest, nicest guys in the world. And for, for uh, PJ's role. No, uh, uh, I was going out for cap. I, I don't even remember the character. It, does, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what, what, whoever Alex. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, um, I, uh, I was like, I'm not doing it. I was so frustrated and I'm sitting there and I was like, I can't do what David is asking me to do. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. And I, I just didn't feel right. I felt, I just said, fuck it. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. And it's this whole monologue. And I went in there and I did it my way. And David went, 
fine, done, bye. And like, literally, I did one fucking take and Dave wouldn't talk. He was so, he was just like this, you know, and I get it. He's yeah. asked me time after time to bring this. Yeah. And I couldn't, so I went this way with it. Yeah. Because it felt right to me. Totally. And uh, so obviously they cast Alex, who's fucking great in the damn thing. When I watched Generation Kill, I'm like, oh, that's what David was asking me to do. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, but what ended up happening is I get a phone call three days later. HBO took that screen test tape and gave it to Spielberg and Tom Hanks. No way. And they couldn't find their lecky. So they cast me in the Pacific off the Generation Kill screen test that I did not get. Wow. What and that's how I ended up story. doing that. So then did you miss like boot camp or what do you, I mean, I'm, or you were construction, so you knew the probably. No, I, I was there for boot camp, man. Oh, you were? I was there. Oh, how was that? Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was an intense experience, man. Yeah, because it's like a, you know, $500 million project. What was that like? It, it, um, that was, if you talk to Bernthal, he'll understand it. If you yeah. talk to Rami Malik, he, how do I say this, man? The people who were there while we shot that. Yeah. Hell, our producer, Tony Toe, who was the guy who said that, no, this is not the right actor, way back when. And he covered the whole thing. He was the guy that basically they just gave him the money and he showed up, he made everything fucking happen. So yeah. Hanks, he was Hanks and Spielberg's like right hand guy. Yeah. So Spielberg and Hanks could talk directly to us through Tony. Tony Toe, if I see him today, I will give him the biggest hug in the world, knowing that that man and myself and all, this other, all these other actors and crew members have experienced something that it's impossible to put into words. Yeah. I, I, I've never worked a job like that before. I'll never work a job like that again. There is no job in this world that could test me as much as that job tests me. Yeah. I've never had a problem on set since that job. I mean, I've been on sets where people are fucking complaining about this or that or whatever the problem might like, dude, you didn't do Pacific motherfucker. Yeah, dude. You don't know. You don't know. You know, everyone from that job, we all, I was engaged at the time, man. Like yeah. we all, everyone's relationship exploded when they went home, except oh. Bernthal, because he's a smart dude. Uh, and John Seda, John Seda, it was interesting to watch John Seda, because John Seda, who has a wife and three kids, yeah. He if he had three days off, he would buy himself a coach plane ticket from Australia to California. Yeah. Just to be with his family for one day. Wow. And then come back. And that's where you, that's where you start to learn about the effort it takes to maintain yeah. to to balance both. To balance a home life. Yeah. And a business that takes all of you because we were there for 10 months, man. Yeah. That was a 10-month job and we gave everything to that and that was the right way to do that job i love that job dearly i, I changed as a person it, it shows man it's like i love that show and, and and i can see the suffering in your character so it's interesting knowing that you guys were literally like in the trenches oh we were a mess <laughs> yeah we were, I, I think we all ended up on medication afterwards you know what i'm I mean? sure what, what you actually saw was the lighter version of what we shot wow we what we shot from the, the, the things that I've heard, uh, it was too dark. And so they, they came in and they kind of um, lightened it up a little bit. Yeah. And it's still dark. It's not, I, I think lightening it up, I'm using the wrong words. It's, that's not right to say that. It was, uh, uh, we gave a lot. I know exactly what you mean. So yeah. yeah, totally, man. That's so beautiful. And then, you know, man, because you share, uh, what was that actress's name that you hugged at backstage after your mother? Was it Juliet or? Judith Light. Dude, like, I want to say, I had that moment with you. You saved my life without knowing me, man. I was, uh, was going through, like, this horrible breakup. I was a shitty boyfriend, addicted to tons of drugs and alcohol, doing so much coke. And I heard about this play called Small Engine Repair that you were doing in the, the West Village at MCC, yeah. the hotel. And I love the hotel, and I'm an actor. Yeah. And I'm drinking and doing so many drugs. I wasn't focusing on my acting. She broke up with me and I had friends that were basically on suicide watch. And I was like, I saw that you were doing it. And I was like, yo, this guy that I love, you know, that I discovered in the Black Donald, he's just doing this play. I want to go see him live finally. They're like, yo, whatever you want to do, we just want to see you happy and not drink. So like, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and saw that play and that moment changed my life. That was the moment I knew 
I was an alcoholic. That was the moment I knew I was meant to pursue this. That was the moment that I decided to get serious about my shit and stop mourning this fucking bitch that, you know, left me for dirty, man. And like, you changed my life. I, I came back and I saw it four times. Even one time during a relapse, I was telling Polono on his episode, I blacked out and came and saw it and don't even remember it. Oh, wow, man. Yeah, dude. So your performance changed my life. I wouldn't be doing this show. I wouldn't, I told Polono this on his episode. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for you, man. Hey, man. I, uh, I'm choking, choking up, man. Like you just, you just made it a full circle right back to what we were talking about in the beginning of like, why do you do theater? Why are you on stage? Why are you telling the story? Yeah. You know? So thank you for telling me that. Cause that gives me a lot of inspiration to get up tomorrow and try to go do it again. You know? Yeah, man. And, and, and on kind of like a meta level of yours, like I was doing off off Broadway shit myself, producing it for no money. Yeah. Still, still paying off the fucking credit cards, dude. Yeah. Let alone I got a fucking podcast now. But uh, it's taped by Stephen Belber, and I always wanted, like, I love what you did with Swino, but I thought I was too young for the role, and I am. But uh, eventually, I got the balls to, like, message Polono before I became buddies with him. I like, yeah. hey, man, kind of told him what I just told you. I'd really love to do it. And he let me do it in New York because I guess, you know, because there was a proximity window to when you guys did it in, like, yeah. was that 2013? I did it in 2000. 19 or 18 yeah and okay. Okay. for, for yeah. no money rented out a theater spent like ten thousand dollars shout out to george bailey julio and andy who were in my cast and and we did it man and like one agent came but like no one came but at the end of the day that was like i knew when that play wrapped i was like i'm doing it like i don't fucking care what anyone's doing i don't like i got to do it and then like come and doing the movie scene you guys do that funny scene that i'll hopefully yeah like it was just like it, it's you saved my life dude thank you man thank you well i i, I well thank john too man <laughs> yeah I, I did trust me i sucked <laughs> yeah man that um actors act man yeah. you know what I mean? and, yeah. and, and we it's so easy to lose sight of why we do this yeah you know it is so much so much coming at us, man, our own negativity, our own, our own feelings, our own ego and, and, and our hopes and our dreams and the business is so confusing. And no one, no one teaches you this stuff. You know, when you're in drama school, when you're in NYU, at Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, holy fuck, man, no one was teaching us any of this shit. No. They just tell you how lucky you are to be there, you know, right. which is true. Right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. A yeah. bunch of weird mask work. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, okay, I did some scene studies and did the worst production of Full for Love anyone has ever done. <laughs> Um, you know, so thank you, drama school. Appreciate yeah. it. Like it's, we act because we do love it. There's, there's something honorable about it, but also like freeing, man. And, you yeah. know, and, uh, I, I, you know, especially we're talking about, you know, what's going on in the world right now. Yeah. And this idea that we can't be around each other. When does live theater get to come back? Know. You know what I mean? When do, when do we get to have that experience again? When do we get to have another small engine repair? Yeah. Or, or, or building the wall, which you were amazing in, man. You know, my, oh, my wow. father, you know, I fucking was there day one, man. I, I they, they sent me the flyers. I was like, fucking, you know, yeah. I bought my ticket. It's like the old, that and Killian Murphy's Three Foot Things and Feathers are the only thing that I've ever bought tickets for in advance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's a genius, man. Yeah. I love, uh, I he's so that. good. By the way, like 28 Days Later is one of like my top five movies, man. Like, if you get, like I, I just, I love that movie. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a genre nerd sometimes. I'm like, that's my favorite zombie movie of all time. Dude, that I, fucking, what's his name? Danny owes me $5,000 because I bought a Canon XL2 after that movie came out. Because <laughs> I was like, that's what they use. I got to create this. <laughs> Sold it for $700 like two years later, man. Oh, uh, God. But that's so beautiful, man. So then I'm curious, when you have all this, you know, you have small engine repair, the Pacific, at a certain point, I imagine you get to be choosier about what's, what you're doing. And what, what after, you know, we're kind of going back to like 2012, 2013, what was interesting to you as an artist? Because that's what you are. Is it, is it content? Is it filmmaker? Is it, is it, is it character? Is it amalgamation of all those? Like, what come? What what makes you say yes? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a bit of an amalgamation of all of all three. Um, uh, I I try to stay filmmaker oriented. You know, if you're talking about film and, yeah. and listen, 
Well, theater's a tough one. I love doing theater, man. I'll do any play, you know, yeah. and that's, that's the danger of theater. It's yeah. really hard to say no to theater. Yeah. Because you're always like, no, wait, 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 we can make it work. We can make it work. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of doing the right play at the right time. Uh, Which is why I think I want to say, because it fucking didn't get the, the justice it deserves. Building the wall, man, like that, at that time, that was like, what, 2017 or was it 16? I can't even remember. But it was like, right as Trump got in office. 2017, and, yeah. Yeah, and it was like, it was so money. Like, what he did as a writer with that, is it Robert Johnson? Or? Robert Schenken. Robert Schenken. Yeah. Like, what he was able to dig into, kind of having that uh, foresight, you know, it's like, it was, and you as that character, man, like, even though he did this atrocious thing, spoiler alert, you, you felt for the guy because he was, he was in kind of that going back to the Simon way. He was, a, he was a product of the system, which yeah. I think we're seeing now, you know, in, in 2020, so many people. Absolutely. Absolutely. A, and I just wanted to give that narrative the honor and I, the immense love it deserves. Me and my father were there no, giving you a, a standing ovation, man. Nah. <laughs> that's, that's the last play I did. Wow. Ah. Since then. Really? No. I gotta, I gotta write something that brings you back. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> that one beat me up a little bit because we um, I got canceled early, right? Yeah, we closed early, and uh, um, it was it was a very rushed process. So it's, it's myself and Tamara Tooney. So it's a yeah, two ninety minutes, no no intermission. Yeah, and um, we we signed off right away. They were like, "Look, we want to do a truncated rehearsal period. We're only going to rehearse for two weeks, and then we're going." Jesus. To and so we're like, yeah, me and Tamar, we're going to get this. We're, and we're slinging, slinging, slinging. And about two days before our first preview, we kind of both went, we can't do this. We're not ready. Like, not only, not only are we having trouble retaining dialogue. Yeah, because it's pretty much two monologues. It's, you got, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, really, yeah. 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 Two 90-minute I mean, two monologues. <laughs> yeah. 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 And sometimes you're not talking with each other. Yeah, it's a question and a story, and then a question and a story. And a you know what I mean? And so yeah. we were having trouble tracking the story, and they were like, "Nope, you're going up." And so me and her went on stage for the first time in front of a live audience. It was the, I, I have never been. This was like every actor's worst nightmare. You know when you wake up in the middle of the night and and you're like, "Oh my god, I was you're naked in front of the hot chick at school, and you don't know yeah, your lines." I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what fucking play I was. <laughs> What fucking, I mean, Samara and I were like, we don't know what play, what the story is. I mean, so we, uh, we said, fuck it. And I looked at her and I was like, I love you. And we entered from fucking different parts of the stage. Yeah. We went on that stage and we did a play without knowing the fucking play. <laughs> and and there, mean, dude. We, we were <laughs> line. I mean, we'd go up and just go, fuck it. Line! And, and like, live, you know? Wow. And, and we got through it. and. Tamara Tooney, uh, I love you. I don't know where you are right now. I, I, that experience to have with another actor, yeah. to go out there with no safety net and no idea of where you are and what you're doing. I, I trust her to the end of the days. I would back her up at any moment. Um, we became road dogs together, and, and we, I had a great time doing that play. But, yeah, we never sold tickets, and so it closed early. That's a bummer because like, I, I thought because I bought early that everyone was buying early. But when I was there, I was like, I tweeted about it. I posted about it. Not that I have any power whatsoever, man. But fuck, it was so good. Yeah. You're, you're, the, uh, you're literally one of the best actors in the world, brother. And I mean that. Like, okay. you keep me inspired. You buoy okay. me. Not, at the, not that this thing's fucking about me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to make it that way. But you, no, 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 no. you've inspired so many people, brother. Like, your work you're doing. I don't even think you have the awareness of how amazing you are. I mean, maybe you do. I don't know. But, like, you've changed so many. Like, there's so many actors, actors that I talk to. And they're like, who, who, do you, who, do you, who do you worship? I'm like, James Badgedale, Chris Ballard. They're like, dude, you're going down my list. You know what I mean? Like, and I mean it, going back to what I said, man. You guys work all the time and you deserve it. And it's fucking, in a business where justice doesn't always prevail, I see it in your career, man. It's like, it's watch, it, it, the whole time that I'm watching work, I'm like, fuck yes. Fuck yes. Fuck yes. You know what I mean? Because as actors, you get so bitter and salty. And when you see a great actor, man, it, 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 you want them to succeed. Yeah, man. I, I, listen, man. Like, you, There's no room for hate 
in this game. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, 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 and I feel it too. We all get into the bitter saltiness, and it's like, no, man, that's counterproductive. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, man. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Don't congratulate. You know yeah. what I mean? No one's, no one's here by mistake, man. You yeah. know, and like, so I, I, I'm, I'm inspired by Shea Wiggum. I'm inspired by Chris Bauer, dude. You know yeah. what I mean? Those are the guys I, I grew up watching. You know, yeah. and uh, man, that, so, yeah, man. Thank you, man. It's just um. I'm Sorry, man. I don't mean to fucking suck your dick today, but I, I mean it. I wanted, I wanted you to know how much. Well, I'm on court. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of sucking dick, let's go to Hightown, man. Fucking yeah. talk to me about this. How did this come your way? Yeah, but you know what? I took 10 years off TV. You did? Intentionally? Uh, intentionally. I didn't know it was going to be so 10. It was 10 between Rubicon and Hightown? 10, maybe 9? No, 10, because we shot Rubicon in 09. Let me also tell the audience, because I saw it's on AMC, that is one of the best, if not the best, uh, espionage shows I've ever seen. And in fact, anytime I'm writing something with someone, I make them watch the pilot. And Michael Christopher, whew, oh. god damn. Oh, right? Yeah, so good. You and him oh. in that show, man. And Dallas. I love Dallas, too, man. Dallas Roberts. Well, I mean, I mean talk about, like, like uh, 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 talent crush, man. So when I was in Stella Adler, yeah. Dallas Roberts was doing that two-hander uh, in the East Village with Sam Shepard. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, I was like, uh, not, not, not the one Ethan Hawke and Paul Dano just did. It, uh, no, 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 no. no. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, it, it's, it's, it's a more of an obscure play. Got that, it. That, okay. You know, I, 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 I don't know if there was ever another production of it, but, yeah. uh, uh, but Dallas, Dallas was the actor's actor. Uh, when I, when I was like 21, 22, I mean, and Dallas Roberts was like 28, 29. I mean, he was literally doing every badass play yeah. in the city. And it was that crew of, it was Dallas Roberts, Michael Shannon, Paul Sparks. Uh, Glenn Fleshler. Yes. Yes. Uh, 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 Michael Curtis. Glenn. And uh, Adam Rapp was, yeah. was kind of, he was like the, 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 the muse. He was writing yeah. for all these guys. And um, so suddenly I'm on set with Dallas Roberts on Rubicon. And I was like, I'm a... I'm, uh, It'd be like me being on set with you. <laughs> I was like, dude, do you want, I was like, do you want a coffee? Do you want a coffee? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some good, some good people out there. You That's know? great, man. And, and, and why you bring up Dallas, it reminds me, because I've only seen two actors, ironically, you and Dallas Roberts ever do this, where I call it stealing a movie. You did that in Flight. He did that in Walk the Line. Like, such a simple scene, but great acting. Like what you did in flight, like I remember watching that scene. What, like, of course, as an actor wanting to do it, but I was just like, James Patchell just stole Denzel Washington's movie. Like, a, a, a five minute scene in a stairwell was some of the, like, that is great acting. What Dallas Roberts is an AR executive telling Joaquin yeah. Phoenix, yeah. you know, you better learn to play from the heart, man, because this soul shit ain't gonna take, yeah. you know, and like, that is, that is. Chris Bauer, you know, they've all, Shay's done it as well. I don't need to limit, but like, dude, what, I mean, talk to me about that. Like a lot of actors, I feel like, especially after your rich body of work could have passed on, I don't even know what to call him, Gaunt Man, you know? Like, yeah, that was, what, young was it really? I think I saw the DP30, so maybe I'm stealing. Yeah, yeah but I, yeah. talk to me about that. I mean, obviously working with Zemeckis and Denzel, you know, I know that's an allure, but how, um, you know, my buddy, like Anthony uh, from Boardwalk Empire. What's the name? Uh, I, th I think I saw a photo, a photo of you and him in Costa Rica. Are you talking about Vinny? Yeah, Vinny. Vinny. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Forever. I know. Yeah, I know him through my buddy's a Rose Bar, but I remember like one time he was telling me that he was up for the lawyer in flight for forever. And then one day his agent just called him and was like, yeah, we're giving it to fucking Don Cheadle. He's like, what? <laughs> And yeah. I, I think I saw in the DP30, you were up for that same role, but then you chose the other one. Uh, yeah, it was, we, it was, they were asking me to come in for uh, the, the lawyer and, uh, or the co-pilot. They haven't cast uh, Brian Garrity yet, who's another great fucking Yeah, I love Brian, man. Dude, I love that dude to death, man. And, um, Stand off at Sparrow Creek. Let's, <laughs> God damn, dude. Yeah, dude, he's my brother. He's my oh dude, my dude. God, man. Yeah. What a, dude, that, that, I love noir. I love pulp. What a great film, man. I mean, yeah, dude, you do. You do the best work. Fuck, bro. Yeah, but see, his thing, you don't know what it's going to be when you get, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it wasn't like it was planned, you know? I, I don't know. I and I love Happy, to, man. Happy's my dude. I to steal a movie from Denzel. Yeah. Even though at one moment in the stairwell, he just went, 
fucking scene stealer and walked away. <laughs> he goes, hey, Bob. Bob Zemeckis, why can't I get dialogue like this? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, Denzel was, I, I love that dude. I learned so much from him. I know I only worked with him for one day. With one, for, for one day. Uh, uh, he couldn't have been cooler to me either, man. He was, yeah. um, at the end of the day, he came up and we just talked about life and death and, uh, and boxing and he just gave me a big hug. And um, uh, Zemeckis comes up to me afterwards and goes, what was that? And I was like, man, we're just talking. And he goes, no, Denzel doesn't do that. And uh, I, I just, uh, that was, it was a good day of work. And it was, you know, it's one of those ones you, look, dude, I had something I wanted to say. Yeah. My mom died of cancer. Yeah. I know what it's like to be around a human being when they're in that mental state, when they've, the drugs and the medication and the treatment have tweaked them to this other place where they're, they're, they're kind of spacey, but they're incredibly present. Yeah. But you're looking at probably in the last week of their life. And uh, uh, so they want me to come in and read the lawyer. And uh, it was the morning of the audition and I couldn't get that scene out of my head. Yeah. And, and I just was like, Fuck. So it was, on, it was on the page. Like you knew right away when you read it, you're like, this is a good That's scene. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I did not understand a word the lawyer or the co-pilot was saying. I, I just couldn't grab it. I couldn't grab it. And then I read that scene. And I was like, I got, I got, no, man, there's something yeah. going on in here. Yeah. And, and I called my manager. I was like, look, I want to read this. I, 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 I want to do the, the, the young gaunt man in the stairwell. Can I audition for that? Yeah. And she starts yelling. She's like, I fucking knew it. You're going to fucking find some stupid one, one scene character. And, 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 and she's like, fine, I'll make the phone call. Knock two zeros off her paycheck. <laughs> you know? and, 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 uh, and, and so she calls you back. And she's like, no, they said no. They won't audition you. I'm like, why not? Why not? I, and now I'm fired up. Yeah. And, and I was like, why not? And she goes, well, they said you're too old for the role. And they have other people in mind. And, and they said, you're just wasting your time. And I said, you call them back and say to them that if I want to waste my time, I'll waste my time. I'll make a deal with them. I'll give them the lawyer. I'll come in this morning and audition the lawyer if they give me one take, one take of the young gaunt man. That's it. And so she calls me back and she goes, they agreed to that. You have an hour to learn that fucking scene. So I sat down and I, I, I kind of just seven page scene i did as much work on that as i could in an hour yeah and i went in and i bombed the lawyer on purpose good choice and, and then i improved the young gaunt man and um and then they uh uh you know they they were like okay well, i'm actually gonna send that to zemeckis and so i'm in london and i'm doing uh world war z with brad oh nice and I get a phone call and they're like, look, uh, can you meet with Zemeckis? Zemeckis, you're looking really good. He really likes you for this role. Yeah. And, uh, and this is a story for another time, but I got, um, I got my front teeth knocked out in London, oh, got on an airplane, flew to New York, had my dentist put a fake flipper in there. And, and the first time I was wearing it, I went and had breakfast with Robert Zemeckis. And I'm eating these, I'm talking to Zemeckis and I'm trying to like keep the eggs in my mouth. Like, this, yeah. you know, and I can't talk to him because my teeth are falling out all over. The place. <laughs> <laughs> back to the future, back to the future. <laughs> right, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, so I show up, he, he, Zemeckis does this thing and I've worked with him twice and he does the same thing. He, 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 he'll, he'll talk to you and then he'll leave. And then he calls you half an hour later and he just says, I just want to do my due diligence here. Would you join me wherever we're shooting to make this job? And it's one of the most, uh, it's just a really old school, beautiful way that he has of conducting himself with other people. Yeah. And um, um, so I said, yes. And I showed up six weeks later, 20 pounds lighter, I lost 20 pounds in six weeks. And I still couldn't talk with that flipper in. And so I sat there at Zemeckis and me and the DP and Zemeckis were in the stairwell. And I said, Hey, Bob, this, this movie is about the truth, right? It's about transparency and us really learning to be who we really are, yeah. you know? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I'm like, look, Bob, this is me. And I took my teeth out 
and I was like, look, can we do it this way? I can talk better like this. <laughs> And he's like, oh, and the DP is like, no, it looks great. And he's like, he's looking at him like, look, it totally makes sense. I looked it up. I researched it with this type of treatment. It's very possible that if you have yeah. teeth problems, teeth will fall out. And he goes, let's go for it. So if you look back at that movie and you look really closely, you realize I got no front grill. Wow. I think some dude's going to put that on IMDb trivia right now. It's amazing. Right now, <laughs> you know, the funny thing about that was uh, I was, uh, was going to do – Steve McQueen, we did Shame, Fassie. Steve wanted me to come in and do a, a scene in 12 Years a Slave. Yeah. And uh, he knew I had had my teeth knocked out. And so when, when Flight came out, and he, or came around, and he was like, how'd it go, how'd it go? Me and him are sitting in New York hanging out. And I was like, yeah, it's great. Um, I gotta let you know, I, I, I took my teeth out. And Steve McQueen was like, you, you, did, you did what? Wait a minute, you took your teeth out for him? So what about me? work <laughs> that I took my teeth out for another director. Yeah, God, that's amazing. Yeah, man. And then, yeah, so so talk to me about that. How did you said it was ten years? And I I had, uh, uh, I just wanted to do other things, man. I, I was living a healthy life. I was out like traveling the world, making movies with people I love, and and for not a lot of money. But I had two dogs and a pickup truck, and I'm just having a good time, you know. And uh, um. Uh, uh, I've noticed a lot of good storytellers are moving into television. I, I noticed everything kind of changed. I mean, if you look at the first season of True Detective, yeah. and how that that affected the that was the catalyst. It really was. was. Catalyst, man. Yeah, yeah. To do, to do smaller arcs with more of a with with a single director or or more of a focus, man. Like let's get we could do eight hours of material. Yeah, and, and do it at a super high level. And not have to worry about making a hundred million opening weekend. It's a different, it's a different beast, man. And um, Rebecca Cutter's writing, it just, I, mean, I was not looking to play another cop. I yeah. definitely wasn't looking to sign a long-term contract into a, 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 a procedural. And it's not a procedural. And that was the thing. Oh. I couldn't get it out of my head. I read her writing. And I was like, fuck, it's really good. And then I couldn't stop thinking about it at night. Yeah. I couldn't stop thinking about this, this world and all the possibilities and the opening up. And I started to feel like, hey, I got something to say. Yeah. It was that same thing of like, you know what? I, am, I, I got something to say. I'm not saying it's going to be good. It might be bad. What but I have to say is mine. It's yeah. unique. And no one else is going to say what I got to say. Yeah. You know? So um, I, I just, uh, I'm working with a great team of people. You know, Jerry Bruckheimer, Rebecca Cutter, Gary Lennon, an yeah. amazing cast. Of just Beth, Beth Bowling and Kim Misha, who've been very gracious to me as well. Yeah. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's a, I couldn't be happier to be doing what we're doing. And, um, you know, look, look, man, the show is dark, it's gritty. I love it. Everybody. I got to see it for the audience yeah. listening and Ray Ashburn. It's a lot of me and him, man. Back in the day, I had my, my affinity for strippers. So, don't we all? Yeah, Ray's got some, <laughs> yeah. Ray's got some, uh, some women issues in his life, as, you know, a lot of us do, man. So, yeah, totally. Uh, and he's got some addiction issues. And, and that's the interesting thing about the show is that everyone is, is, has, is on a different plane of the addiction recovery uh, arc. Yeah. Different places for different reasons. And, That's uh, what I loved about the show. I'm glad you brought that up, you know, because yeah. I really related to that, to that character. Yeah. But, uh, dude, I know you got places to be, things to do. I'll be out in Montauk this summer, man. Let's do it again. Let's do it live and we'll kick it. Oh, man. Yeah. Dude, I got so much love for you, James Badgedale. Thank you for giving right. up. Giving Thank you. Back, and it means the world. All right, man. Love you, man. All right, man. All right, peace.